like to do is I'd like to talk to you tonight on the theme of unity, glory, and God's presence. By God's presence, what I'm talking about is the Shekinah presence of God. And when we're talking about Shekinah, maybe you've heard that word before. If you haven't, don't worry about it. It's not in the Bible, interestingly enough, though it is a biblical concept. And Shekinah is a form of a Hebrew word that means he dwells here. And it's used to reference the manifestation of God's presence in a visible way in a place. So we're talking about where you can tangibly, we can sense God's presence. But then there is when God visits his people, there are times where he visibly demonstrates his presence. In the Old Testament, the Shekinah was seen as a cloud in Exodus 24, 16. A cloud comes down on Mount Sinai, and that cloud is there for seven days. God speaks from within the cloud, calls Moses up on the mountain. In uh, chapter 33 and verse 9, remember Moses goes out to the tent of meeting, and when he goes out to the tent of meeting, which is a half mile outside the camp, a cloud comes down, and, and God is there. It's a visible manifestation of the presence of the Lord. All the people see it, and Moses goes in and God speaks to him from the cloud as a man talks with his friend. He talks face to face. First Kings chapter 8, this is a, that is the story of the dedication of Solomon's temple. We're going to be looking at it from Chronicles uh, tonight. Then you have a pillar of smoke and fire in Exodus 13. So when the nation of Israel goes out of Egypt, they're going out at night and they are led by the presence of God, which is visibly evident as a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And then you have a visible demonstration in Zechariah 2.5 where God says, I will be a wall of fire. You'll see me and you'll know it's me because I'm going to be a wall of fire around you. And then in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2, it's a burning bush. All of those are examples of God's visible presence. Here's what's interesting, and the reason why I would talk about this is because as we're in a move of God, um, part of me would want to wait and say, explain something after the fact. The other part of me says, you know what, uh, I, I think we do well to be aware of some things, especially because uh, most people in this room have not been a part of a ginormous move of God. I mean, you might have been to a revival, seen some things, but if God is moving in power, and he is, and if we're going to see more, and I believe we are, Amen. because we're watching just a building intensity by almost any metric you want to use. And so it is possible that the glory of God could manifest himself at any campus in a visible way, his Shekinah presence there. At Azusa Street, that was common in 1906 or 1909 for three and a half years. They had regular demonstrations of God's Shekinah presence. But it wasn't every time. So they might, it might be more evident at some times than at other times, might not be visible on some days, might be incredibly visible on others. There's a woman by the name of Mariah Woodworth Edder. She was a revivalist that ministered from the 1880s through the early 1920s, and she had a tent that seated 8,000 people. And she was all over the Midwest. She was out in California. She was out east and would pack this tent out. Newspaper accounts there are of, of people coming. And um, they would have at times visible demonstrations of the Shekinah glory of God. 
at Azusa Street what it looked like on many occasions there would be flames of fire coming out of the roof of the building where they were meeting so so visible was it that people would call the fire department and the fire department would come and there was there was no fire to put out but there was flame coming out of the top of the building other accounts say that the flame was not only coming out of the top of the building, but it was coming down out of the sky, and it was meeting over where the Azusa Street meeting was. It was the Shekinah presence of God. Other times, the Shekinah would be a cloud of glory in the auditorium that at times would, would literally, there would be like a mist that was, had a glow to it and a sparkling to it in the midst, and they would recognize it as the Shekinah glory. Probably one of the more prevalent uh, manifestations of God's Shekinah at Azusa was a, a cloud that was about two feet high, and it was just all over the ground. It looked like smoke. And one, one account, the guy talks about sitting next to William Seymour and watching William Seymour kind of play with it and try to kick it, and you couldn't move it. It was there, but it was, it was just thick. And whenever the cloud was there, extraordinary things would happen. In Mariah Woodworth Edder's meetings, um, there were visible signs of light and a cloud on the platform. Sometimes there was other manifestations. There were um, at times angelic beings that were seen on the platform by the whole room. At times there were, uh, there was in one instance a flaming sword over the platform. And um, she writes this, the church in one occasion, the church was full of the glory of God. It was like a mist. People fell down in their seats all over the church. Overpowered by the glory of God, sinners came out crying for mercy. So the cloud came down, and as the cloud came down, people were knocked over by that. So that would be a, another demonstration of God's power. Some would call that being slain in the spirit, which is probably the most common term where the presence of God is so great that people either fall forward or fall back and they're in the presence of the Lord, sometimes for 15, 20 minutes. In some meetings that Mariah Ed Woodworth Edder did, people were down for three hours, some were down for a day, some were down for two days. One woman was slain in the spirit for eight days. At times, hundreds of people would be slain in the spirit. And at both um, Azusa and in her meetings, people would be out in the street and be slain in the spirit. People might be miles away and be slain in the spirit. And the newspaper, I think it's the Indianapolis paper, records as the reporters were walking up to the meeting where her tent was, they said it looked like a literal battlefield as people were laying all over outside, slain in the spirit. Um, there were times when hecklers would come. And in one particular instance in St. Louis, hecklers came and uh, there was about 50 of them and they were all slain in the spirit. And when they came to, they got saved and were filled with the spirit. So it's very interesting to read these accounts. Um, you say, but what if, what if when that happens, that all sounds a little like crazy. And I, I realized because I know not everybody here is, is in fact, most people I would say are not from a background where you've seen anything like that or maybe even heard anything like that. And that's why I think something like we're talking about here is helpful for you in your consideration and your processing of it because some people say, well, that just sounds like crazy and like it's bedlam and, and like it's fanaticism. Um, Mariah Woodworth Edder said this, we have always had the best of order. We never allow fanaticism. Every honest person will have to admit that it is God working through his people. So what happens is there are some quadrants of the church that have determined that when God moves, it gets crazy. Now, I would suggest when God moves, you will see things that you maybe have not seen before, and you might see things you've not, you, you don't understand 
But I also think that um, having studied this, it's not necessarily a given that um, it's a free-for-all. In fact, one of the things that was a criticism at Azusa Street was that there was not some guidance on some of those areas. So um, all of that to say, I don't want anybody to think that once God begins to move, uh, everybody loses their mind and there is no order. God is a God of order. And yet when God moves in power, there are things that go beyond our understanding. But still what she is saying is, it's not fanaticism and things were in order. Now, that is a, a look at a more contemporary, even though we're talking 100 years ago, uh, a more contemporary treatment of some of that. But you see it in the Bible. And what we see in the Bible, we could go to several different instances where you see people exposed to the presence of God, the Shekinah of God, and how they respond to that. But what I want you to understand is that it's, it's always God's desire to reveal himself to his people, and God will reveal himself always in accordance to the desire and the preparedness of his people. God's not going to go beyond what we would desire. And God's going to be in some sense, he is going to limit what he does based on our preparation for his move in our midst. And so I just want to take a few minutes and I want to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 5. It's a very, very interesting passage and it gives us insight into our responsibility as worshipers if we're going to experience God's Shekinah presence because I really believe God desires to demonstrate who he is to his people. I mean, what else could we conclude than when two million people hear the voice of God and two million people see the Shekinah glory of God come down? I mean, God desires to show his power. What is the day of Pentecost? It's God's Shekinah presence, tongues of fire. That's the Shekinah presence of God visible. And that phenomenon as well has been repeated in history. It wasn't limited to the day of Pentecost. So God delights to reveal himself to his people. When you come to um, Second Chronicles, it's the dedication of Solomon's temple. And so this is one drawing of it. There's the altar outside. There's the laver where the priests would wash themselves. Here are all the basins and the carts where they clean themselves up after having slaughtered the animals because literally at a feast time, it is a slaughterhouse. In fact, when Solomon dedicates the temple, he sacrifices 22,000 head of cattle. I mean, talk about a crazy thing a real great barbecue. Um, <laughs> so you have the temple, and this is a cutaway. So when you go into the temple, what you have is you have the priest, and he is going to, at the time of the morning sacrifice and evening sacrifice, he's going to take coals off the altar. And there are, within the priesthood, there are 24 divisions. So there would be approximately, um, there would be, uh, 2,000 in each division, so once a month, or once, there would be one month out of the year that two divisions would serve at the temple, and they would provide for all the people that were worshiping. At holy days, there would be, all the priests would assemble. But then what would happen, and we know this from in Luke's gospel, Zachariah is a godly old priest. He's from the division of Abijah, and so it's his time to be at the temple serving as he's there at the temple. His name is drawn. There's a lottery to determine who gets to go into the holy place and offer the, uh, put the coals on the altar, burn incense, put the incense on there, and then smoke goes up, and as smoke goes up, it's indicative of the prayers of the people. What's interesting is when you get to the book of Revelation, all your prayers are stored around the throne and they are incense unto God. It's a really encouraging thing to think this, that the minute you pray, it goes up to God. 
that your, your prayers are heard in heaven right away. They're like incense to the Lord. So, you know, it's, uh, you know what you have here is you have the holy place, got the table of showbread, got the golden uh, lampstands, you've got the altar of incense. Doors would separate the holy place from the most holy place, and there inside the most holy place, you have two huge cherubim, and then you have the Ark of the Covenant, and um, the high priest would go in there only once a year on the Day of Atonement, only after offering sacrifices for himself, his sin, and the sin of the people. He would go in, he would splatter the blood on that, and he would get out of there. You didn't linger in the Holy of Holies which the significance of Jesus' death is when he dies on the cross, the veil, at that point, they have a curtain instead of a, a wall and a door, and the veil is torn from the top to the bottom as if not bottom to the top as if man is opening it up, top to the bottom as, as if God is opening the holy, the most holy place and saying, come on in to my presence. So this is what they're dedicating as we look at it. Let's read it beginning in verse 9. These poles were so long, their ends extending from the ark could be seen from the front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place. They're still there today. So they put the ark of the covenant in the most holy place. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, or that's also Mount Sinai, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. So what it's telling us is in the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant. And in that Ark of the Covenant, there's one thing. There are the two tablets. We think of the Ten Commandments as being on one tablet. Actually, they're on two tablets. The first tablet has the first four commandments that have to do with our vertical relationship with God. The second tablet has to do with the remaining six commandments that have to do with our horizontal relationship with people around us, starting with honoring our parents and then not murdering and not committing adultery and not lying and not coveting and not stealing, all those things. So inside your heart, in the most holy place in your life, my question to you is in the tabernacle because, or in the temple. So in the Old Testament, God has a temple for his people. In the New Testament, he has a people for his temple. You and I are the temple of the living God. In the interior, in the holiest place in, in you, is the word of God there. Have you placed the word of God in your heart so that the word of Christ dwells in you richly in the words of Paul? Or are there other things in your most holy place? Other things competing for the word, canceling out the word, drowning out the word? What's in, what's in the inner sanctum of your life? One of the things that's very interesting is it all starts with what's in the holy place. If we want to see God's glory and we want to see his presence, then it's incumbent upon you and I to get the word of God in our heart so that, so that we're grounded, so that Christ dwells richly in us through his word in our heart. Colossians talks about that. Then we read in verse 11, the priests then withdrew from the holy place, and all the priests who were there had consecrated themselves. So they're getting ready. Consecration is getting ready for God. It's making space in your heart for God to do something in your life. They're getting ready. Remember in Joshua 3, 5, consecrate yourselves today for tomorrow the Lord's going to do great things. When they're on, at Mount Sinai, Moses says, consecrate yourselves. And he gives them a list of things to do. He says, get ready because God's going to show up. His glory's going to come down. We err if we think. It doesn't matter how we live. It doesn't matter how we think. And it doesn't matter how we think about God. God's just going to show up if he wants to. That's not true. That you and I have a responsibility to get ready for the moving of God in this place by getting ready for the moving of God in our life. 
so that we say, you know what, I'm going to get rid of those things that hinder me from hearing from God, from serving God like he would desire me to. And, and sometimes it's not sinful things. We lay aside things that easily encumber us and the sin, Hebrews says, that besets us. So obviously we get rid of sin, but, but then there are some things that aren't necessarily sin. They're just not good for you. Good things that have become too important. Priorities that have gotten out of whack. Things that cause God to be in second place in the way we decide, in the way we do things, in the way we schedule things. So there's a place for us to consecrate our heart and, and to say, as we're coming into the prayer meeting, because really what you have in, in Second Chronicles is you have a dedication, but it's a prayer meeting. They're all praying. I'm just simply saying God wants to do something in this place, and he, I believe he will, but a part of what has to happen is we have to embrace the responsibility to prepare ourselves for his arrival. They consecrated themselves. Did they know what was going to happen? No. Did God say, hey, get ready, because I'm going to come down in a cloud, and I'm going to blow your mind. No, they consecrated themselves because they wanted to be ready for whatever God was going to do. There has to be a sense in our heart that says, I expect God to show up big in this place, and I have every reason to because he already has, but there's more. That we're on the front end, not the back end. That we're moving closer to his heart. So we consecrate ourselves. And then notice as well, it says this, the priests then withdrew from the holy place, and all the priests who were there consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. It's very interesting because what can happen is when you get a group of people together, they can automatically begin to divide themselves. You know, they have their friends, they have the people they associate with, they have their occupations, they have their season of life, they have all, there's all these things that, if we're not careful, can divide us. I think this is a word, and we're going to see this, this word divisions is, is a very interesting thing, regardless of their divisions. In other words, here come the priests, and the priests say that, that we're going to operate as one as we're waiting for God to show up. Amen. There has to be a, a sense of desired unity with the people around us. In fact, I would suggest that a part of what that involves is as we're getting ready to meet with the Lord, and this is why communion is so important, is because as you're holding the bread, the bread is a reminder on the one hand of the righteousness of Christ. On the other hand, the bread that you're holding is a reminder that you're one with everybody else in this room, and together we form the loaf, which is the body of Christ. Together we're the body of Christ, not individually, together. We're one with one another. But you're not one with one another if you got it out for one another. You can't have unity if you have bitterness. You can't have unity if you have jealousy. You can't have unity if you have competition. You can't have unity if you got comparison. So as we're getting ready for God to move, one of the things that's incumbent as we consecrate ourselves, as we think about getting ready, is to make sure that we don't have something going on between us and someone else. Do you realize this is the responsibility everybody owns in this place, that you're hanging on to a bitterness or a competitive spirit or an envy could stop the move of God. And so what has to happen is that we have to 
come into this place where we're all in one accord. This again, there's a lot of parallels between what we read here and Acts chapter 2, which is New Testament. They spent 10 days, and during that 10 days, you spend 10 days in one room with, with the same group of people, 120 people, you're going to have to work a few things out. They had to get on the same page. Which means if you have it out for somebody, and maybe they know you do, and there was a disagreement, love the church enough and desire a move of God enough to go get it right between the two of you. On the other hand, let me say this. You might, you might envy somebody. You might not like somebody. You may think poorly of somebody, and they have no idea. In that case, you don't go to them and say, I just need to tell you, I've never liked you. I've always thought you were a jerk. And I remember this one time. And then you lay them out. And really what you're doing is you're getting even with them. Listen, if they don't know anything about it, the problem isn't between you and them. It's between you and God. You need to go to God and say, God, this person doesn't even know that I have these feelings. God, I got to have you help me. I'm, I'm wrong. So, regardless of their divisions, and all the Levites who were musicians, Asaph, Heman, Jaduthan, and their sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar dressed in fine linen. Uh, almost everybody that I read talks about that's indicative of the purity. At this point, they have consecrated themselves. They're in a unity, and there is a purity there. And when, when there is a purity, that is attractive to the presence of God. And they're playing cymbals, harps, and lyres, and they were accompanied by 120 priests. This is very, very interesting. How many are in the upper room? 120. How many priests are here when the glory of God's going to come down in a spectacular fashion? 120. So they were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets, and the trumpeters and the singers joined in unison. So all of a sudden, they're, they're working, they're doing what they do as with one voice. I mean, it's amazing. So they're in this, they're in this season where God is, is working and working among them, and no doubt they practice but you have to believe that the Spirit of God is working in that moment. One of the things that Azusa Street that, that people comment on when you read the accounts is the heavenly choir. You say, what's the heavenly choir? Well, when you read Mariah Eder's accounts of the same thing, she describes it more fully. What would happen at times is she could have a tent with 2,000 people, and all of a sudden the people would spontaneously simultaneously begin to sing a song they did not know in multi-harmony. You say, how's that possible? The Spirit of God. It's called the heavenly choir because all of a sudden people start singing a song they didn't know, prompted by the Spirit. The Spirit of God so coming upon the place, everybody is singing a song. It's almost hard to imagine, isn't it? And they said at Azusa and in Mariah's meetings that what would happen when that happened, there would be an outpouring of the Spirit and there would be signs and wonders that would be very unusual in that moment. It would set that up in the, in the presence of the Lord. Because again, you have a demonstration of the Spirit's power displayed in the unity of the people. Very hard for the Spirit to do that if people are at one another. They would also have, interestingly enough, people who would appear to be playing instruments, only the instruments were invisible, but they were in the Spirit playing instruments, and the sound could be heard throughout the building, throughout the tent, or the building, because sometimes she was in arenas. And at Azusa, they would have similar things. The trumpeters and the singers joined in unison as with one voice to give praise and thanks to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments. So there's this, this incredible unity that's happening. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity, the psalmist says, Psalm 133, verse 1. It's like oil being poured on Aaron's head 
down on his, flowing down on his beard onto his robes. It's like the dew on Mount Hermon. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. When you have unity, you're going to have the hand of God come down on a place. They have exceptional unity. They raise their voices in praise to the Lord. Now let me, let me say something about this, because again, this is a part of what's happening. So you've got all of these people raising their voices to the Lord, and we're going to see that in chapter 7. You can worship the Lord quietly. You can, you can worship the, the Lord with a lot of different ways, but you can't praise him quietly. Praise always involves a vocalizing. It always involves a, a, an expressive response. Um, a, the very word hallelujah means get excited about God. You know, it's like the wide receiver in the end zone doing the touchdown dance. I mean, some of you, it'd be good for you to do that, you know, in here. Get that excited that you, you, you let your feet move a little bit, okay? Be good. So here they are. They raise their voices and praise the Lord, and they sing, He is good. His love endures forever. So here they are. They're just worshiping the Lord. They're united. They've consecrated their hearts. They've sanctified the place with the word of God. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. You say, why couldn't they perform their service? Well, there's a couple of things that would happen. And again, I, we don't know exactly what happened, but if we, if we look at revivals where the presence of the Lord happened um, in power and a cloud came down, it's very possible they were slain in the spirit that they fell prostrate before the Lord. That the, the weight of the glory of God just knocked him over. Remember when Jesus, they're going to arrest him, and there's 600 Roman soldiers, and they say, Jesus says, who are you looking for? And we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he, and immediately they all fall over. Amen. It's, he is the incarnation of the glory of God. He is the cloud, if you will. And in that moment when he says, I am, that is, I am is the eternal covenant keeping God is he's saying I am and when they have that revelation of him they fall over could be that it could also be that they are in that moment frozen in a trance you say well, that seems kind of weird well we know that Peter was in a trance in Acts 10 we know that at Azusa Street and we know in in Mariah Edder's Re recollections that there were times people would be frozen in place and they would be beholding the glory of God but unable to move and when they were you say well that sounds really weird and I don't know how would I feel about that well if you saw what they saw you'd be loving it because they would come out of it having seen visions of heaven having seen um, angelic uh, encounters all kinds of supernatural things, but in that moment, unable to respond physically because of the glory of the Lord and what they're beholding in the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. We read in chapter 7, verse 1, so Solomon's prayed when he finished praying, fire came down from heaven. Again, this is very similar to the book of Acts is very similar to the day of Pentecost. They're all meeting together in a room. They're all in one accord. And what happens? There's a wind. The place begins to shake. And fire comes down and splits apart and appears over their head like a burning flame. Here, the fire came down and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. And when all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, all the Israelites, again, you have this unity of response and expression. You know, all the Israelites, there are people in this group that are, know the Lord 
very deeply people who probably barely know him. But all of them, when they see the glory of the Lord instantly, they're moved to respond. And they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and they gave thanks to the Lord saying, he is good, his love endures forever. Listen, I, I just simply saying that in order, I believe God wants to move in this place and I believe the prayer meeting it doesn't have to be, God can do anything he wants, but he is meeting us here at every campus online. He's meeting us in a very unique way. And so just, I, I think there's great value in, in looking at things like this and saying, what is it that precipitates an extraordinary experience of God? Because we go from glory to glory to glory, right? So what is it that fills your heart? Is it the word of God or is, is, have other things crowded out the word from your life? And when you, come, when you come into church Sunday or Wednesday, do you come with a, a life that's consecrated and a heart that's prepared that says, God, I've made room in my life, not only in my schedule physically, but in my heart for you to, to move. And I've removed anything that would get in the way of me interacting with you or that would dishonor you. And have you taken care of the things that could divide you from others so that we don't have unity? Because if we don't have unity, you can't have God's presence. And then as we're worshiping, listen, this is not a talent contest and it's not, it's not the people who can sing and love to sing, sing. When it comes to praise, it's everybody making a, a joyful noise to the Lord, which in heaven, it, it grabs the attention of God's very throne. So we come in here and we say, listen, with all of my heart, I'm gonna worship the Lord. And when we do that, he comes down in an extraordinary way. God wants to display his glory. He wants to display his glory to us. We go from glory to glory the, by, by the Lord who is the spirit, Paul says in 2 Corinthians. And so I'm just simply saying, I, I believe God wants to do more. He wants us to experience more but there's also an attendant responsibility that we have to say, God, I'm gonna press in more. And can I just tell you, it's worth every effort you and I would make. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.